Coming up on this edition of Ableton on Air, we talk to the foremost expert on periphery, uh, peripheral artery disease, Dr. Phillips, and we will talk about blood flow and all that coming up next. Stay tuned. Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps, Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yihad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Able Then On Air has been seen in the following publications. Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Ableton On Air is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television, Arts, and Sciences, Boston, New England chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists. Welcome to this edition of Ableton On Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently able. I'm your host, Lauren Seiler. On this edition of Ableton On Air, we focus on peripheral artery disease and the foremost expert on peripheral artery disease, Dr. Phillips. Welcome to uh, Ableton On Air. Very nice to have you on the show today. Um, Dr. Pleasure. Phil yeah. Um, so you're an, an interventional cardiologist. Can you explain to our audience what training you have and what your, um, in, as they say, uh, specialty in that area? Sure. So again, thanks for having me on the show. Looking forward to our conversation. I am an interventional cardiologist. Basically, I tell patients that I'm a plumber. Uh, so... My training is four years of medical school, three years of internal medicine residency, three years of general cardiology fellowship, and then one year of interventional cardiology training. And then after that, you're perpetually learning, or at least you should try to be. Mm -hmm. And so I am entering, or excuse me, almost into my 13th year post a fellowship training. Uh, so my um, initial training was in uh, the coronary arteries. So the arteries that supply the heart, patients who have blockages, have chest pain, shortness of breath, those having a quote heart attack. So we try to open those vessels up and then I kind of morphed or pivoted a little bit to focusing more on peripheral arterial disease. So blockages within the arteries in the legs primarily and helping patients uh, get better blood flow and thus relieve symptoms. And in some instances, patients can have such severe blockages where they'll develop an ulceration that leads to um, you know, poor healing and a wound and then potentially an amputation. And so ultimately we try to do our best to 
uh, be a part of the team that that saves the leg and 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 saves the piggies uh, as um, we've been come to know. Well, when you say save the pi- uh, piggies, which means basically the foot, um, explain a little bit more. But um, also explain. I'm I'm initially um, interested in your passion of saving legs. Because my wife lost hers. She lost, uh, she, you know, it was um, above the knee as well. But can you, um, can you kind of explain, you know, she lost hers due to diabetes. But uh, can you explain more about blood flow and that, and that kind of thing? Sure. So <clears throat> the heart pumps the blood blood is the nutrient and it's it's kind of the gasoline that makes the engine and the the body the car work and so the heart pumps the oxygenated blood and the nutrient rich blood to all the organs your brain your your arms your hands your kidneys your gut um, and then you know your legs and ultimately all, all the way down to the toes and so when there is a potential narrowing of the blood vessels, those are called the arteries, whereby plaque um, builds up within the wall and it slowly causes the, we call it the lumen or the opening of the tube to kind of get more narrow and narrow. And at some point, the, it can be so narrow that it can rest, restrict the flow and patients develop symptoms of pain and aching and heaviness in their legs when they walk. Or in the case of the heart, patients get chest uh, heaviness or discomfort with exertion. And uh, in the case of the heart, when that vessel closes down 100%, they can develop uh, what's called a myocardial infarction or the, the, the lame person's term is heart attack. Mm-hmm. And that's when, we you know, I was just on call last night when we get called in the middle of the night for someone who's having a, quote, heart attack, and we go in and try to open up the vessel and restore flow and help them. In the legs... I imagine uh, in the leg in the legs is gangrene and all of that stuff, correct? Yeah. So when someone has uh, an all se- severely uh, diminished blood flow, potentially from risk factors that do include diabetes or smoking or high cholesterol, uh, that blood flow, if it's restricted severely enough, and the patient gets a wound, it's typically on the the tips. So it is the toes, and that's kind of why I started the quote "save my piggies" term. Um, and uh, that can lead to discoloration. That can lead to the term called gangrene. So the, the, the toe essentially dies because it doesn't get blood flow and needs to be amputated. And in some instances, infection can spread or the amount of uh, the degree to which the lack of blood flow is so profound that it can lead to wounds that just don't heal. And then unfortunately, the patient may require a major amputation, uh, such as your wife. And again, so I'm sorry to... Just, I'm sorry to hear it's that fine. she had that because those are tough. Those are tough. It's fine. I mean, you know, her life her life was saved, but, but unfortunately we had to go through that. Um, but when it comes to saving lives, um, you know, some people have other challenges, you know, other medical challenges. Um, you know, do you think ethically, let's see if I'm saying this right, do you think ethically there could be uh, better ways doctors can uh, help their patients if they know exactly what's going on? Because um, let's say a person is special needs and needs uh, uh, an amputation, but uh, is there certain ethical language that a person can be explained because sometimes a person with a special need might not understand what's going on. Are there certain ways that doctors are um, explaining things to patients better or do you think it could be done better when consulting a patient who might have special needs? If I'm saying that correct? Sure. I think think if I understand it, um, it's important when you're describing something that's fairly complex. So for example, a lot of times patients interchange the term vein and artery, and they're two different highways. 
Mm. Us, that's as physicians, that's really important because there are two different disease processes and methods of treatment. But it just highlights the fact that there's this kind of general, um, um, and I don't want to say lack of awareness, but it, there's just a misconception about what it is. And so it's my job, at least the way I see it, to explain the procedure or explain the disease process and in technical terms you know for example a consent form for a procedure is to be written in fourth grade language so we and, and i don't think that that's meant to belittle the intelligence of the person that you're treating but it just kind of level sets it makes things it easier so, for them to understand exactly and so i like when i don't understand something for example, if my mechanics is trying to explain to me about my catalytic converter or whatever, I'll say, wait, pretend I'm a kindergartner. Explain it to me like that because that's how I understand it. So I, I don't, it, it doesn't matter if you have special needs or not. We have to do a good job of explaining it. Now, I have treated patients with special needs, and, it, and I have a very soft spot in my heart. My, I, my brother has Down syndrome, um, and so, you know, he – he needs someone to help him with a lot of stuff and he can't make real you know decisions for himself and so i always make sure that the patient has a power of attorney or a parent or somebody who's there with them to help explain mm -hmm. it and even if they can't you know if that patient doesn't understand exactly what's going on we can still comfort the patient and and assuage their fears and make sure that they're um, not you know super anxious if a procedure needs to happen so there's a lot of ways that we can we can discuss a plan or a treatment option or a procedure with a patient. We just have to make sure that it is such that the patient understands. And oftentimes I ask the patient, explain. Uh, do, the, do you understand what I'm saying? Do you have any questions? Explain it back to me because I think that's a really good way to be a, be a good to be a good communicator, regardless if you're a physician or not. Okay. Uh, what are some of the underlying conditions uh, such uh, as with diabetes and people with special needs should be aware <clears throat> that might lead to vascular problems such as peripheral artery disease? Sure. So I like to lump it in what we call modifiable risk factors and non-modifiable. Modifiable means if I stop doing something or if I start doing something, I can make it better or worse in some instances. So, for example, people who smoke. That is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease, so heart attack, cerebrovascular disease, stroke, and then peripheral arterial disease. And so you can modify that. You can stop smoking. Uh, exercise. The more we exercise mm -hmm. on a regular basis, it's not just I'm active at work. I saw a patient today who said, yeah, I'm active. I climb a lot of stairs. That's great, but it doesn't count. You have to do something like walk on the treadmill for 20 minutes, get your heart rate up or lift weights or do something because yep. exercise has been shown time and time again to increase a patient's longevity and reduce cardiovascular rates and events. And it also actually reduces cancer rates. So those are two examples of some modifiable risks. And then the, the non-modifiable are just kind of the genetic cards that you're dealt. You have a family history of early heart disease. You have a genetic predisposition for a clotting disorder, things of that nature. Um, perhaps you were born as a type one diabetic, meaning you just don't have the insulin, don't make it, or you develop as a type two diabetic into diabetes and you become insulin resistant that's kind of modifiable. You can change your diet, you can exercise, lose weight, and you can turn the tide on that. So there's a lot of risk factors, but the biggest ones in my mind, diabetes, smoking, and then kidney disease, particularly for, for, for arterial disease. Okay. Um, when you consult families with their conditions, um, is there special language or protocols I think, I think we went back to that same question, but is there special language you might um, use for someone who has special needs? Like my wife, is there other language to use or you just? A lot of times I, I'm a visual learner. So in addition to 
making sure the language is not over somebody's head or under their head too, to be honest, because sometimes we'll have people who have medical background and they'll want to know more. But I, I start off at like the fourth grade level, but I think visual learning is helpful. So, so you show the graph of basically this is your arteries, this is what we, we need to be aware of and that kind of uh, issue, correct? Exactly. We try to either draw it out or, I mean, Google's great. You can Google whatever and you can find it. Mm -hmm. You have to be careful about Dr. Google and, and don't mistake Dr. Google for, you know, my medical degree. But nonetheless, it, uh, it's, it's, it's helpful. Mm -hmm. um, now, how do you explain to them uh, uh, what's needed for a procedure to open up their arteries for PAD? So the way I describe it is oftentimes if I'm seeing somebody for the first time that has a suspected diagnosis of peripheral arterial disease, we'll do a very thorough physical exam, check for pulses. You can, you know, Lawrence, I don't know if you've ever felt your pulse on your wrist, but you, that's, that's telling you a lot of information. Mm -hmm. Well, we can feel it in the growing. We can feel it behind the knee and we can feel it on the top of the foot. We can feel it by the ankle and you know you you assess the pulse to see what the blood flow is and if if the pulse is missing in one of those areas then we get worried that there might be a blockage we can do very simple blood pressure cuff like testing to see if there is blockage if there is based on that then we can add on ultrasound testing and cat scan testing and ultimately in order to quote fix an artery through what I, so I'm a, an interventionalist, meaning I get into the artery using a needle. I'm not a surgeon, thus I don't have a scalpel. And so we do an, what's called endovascular, the endovascular approach, mm -hmm. uh, minimally invasive. But I, we will put a tube in the artery and then we inject contrast, iodinated contrast, which then under fluoroscopy lights up the the, the pattern of flow within that vessel. And if there's a narrowing or a blockage, we can oftentimes open it up with a balloon. We can use a special balloon that has some little blades on it. We have devices called atherectomy that remove the plaque or burrow a hole in it. We have special balloons that are like uh, shockwave. I don't know if you've ever had a, known anybody with a kidney stone and undergone mm -hmm. kidney stone lithotripsy. We can do that. And we have stents that can act as a scaffold to, to prop the vessel open. So what is a stent, what is a stent uh, exactly? Sure. So a stent, they're typically made out of um, a, a nitinol component. Um, so it's, um, you know, nickel and cobalt chromium uh, and, and, and sometimes uh, some, some platinum. Um, but uh, they are, it's a scaffold basically. And so it, it comes kind of compressed and then you open it up inside the vessel and it, and it acts, it has a certain amount of force that helps kind of spring the vessel open and keep it open. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so uh, are there any new trends in the treatment of PAD that, should, that we should be aware of? So peripheral arterial disease has been around since the dawn of time. We've been using stents for probably since, you know, eight, the eighties. Um, we have developed over the last 10 plus years stents with medications on them that help prevent what we call restenosis or cell buildup within the stent that ultimately re-narrows the vessel. We have, balloons that we can inflate and kind of push the debris up against the wall and those balloons have have the medication on them to help uh, reduce that cell growth we have devices that can remove some of the plaque some of the newer devices as i mentioned with the lithotripsy that that shockwave type therapy work uh, we have uh, develop kind of newer ways to reroute the blood flow and, and do bypasses that aren't surgical. Ideally, what we need to do is be more proactive than reactive in this space. 
meaning get people in their 20s and early 30s when they're starting to develop plaque disease and make sure that we're reducing their risk factors like telling them to stop smoking, start exercising, monitoring their cholesterol, blood pressure, and things of that nature. Because peripheral arterial disease, once diagnosed, has death rates that are higher than a lot of cancers, which is kind of scary. And so I've last few years have been telling my patients when they have peripheral arterial disease, it's like having cancer. It's really hard to cure. We kind of keep it at bay, but it's something that's going to be with you the rest of your life. Um, okay. Uh, I'm not, I'm not sure how often you explain the procedure to your patients, especially if there's special needs, but <clears throat> however, but many of us do research very well online. Uh, I saw a big debate uh, of research over drug-coated balloons and how how they used to push their uh, their gunk that's blo blocking the arteries uh, to the side. These are special balloons that often have drugs that um, help the artery open longer. Can you explain um, what these are? Uh, it, well, um, um, I kind of hyphenated it. Uh, uh, pac Paclitaxel uh, coated balloons and why they're important? Sure, so Paclitaxel is a chemotherapeutic agent uh, that uh, basically inhibits cell growth so it, it works within like you know the um the cell cycle for the cell to replicate so it stops the cell from replicating because there's something called smooth muscle cell proliferation so these cells that line the walls of the artery when they become touched by a balloon or a stent you know, the body says, hey, this is a foreign object, you're disrupting me, and the body's trying to kind of cure itself a little bit, and so these cells can, can multiply and build up and create like, it's like stacking bricks on top of each other, and the more bricks narrow the, the opening, mm -hmm. and so the paclitaxel inhibits that, that cell growth. It, um, a few years ago, there was some concern that it may cause increased death rates in patients, but we debunked that um, theory pretty quickly. And I firmly believe that these medicated balloons have really improved the lives of a lot of our patients. We've been using these medica a medication like that and, and a different medication in the heart arteries with stents for, for uh, upwards of 30 years, and those work quite well also mm -hmm. i don't believe that the good lord meant for us to be putting metal stents in our arteries but we also um have uh, you know it's it's fast in the 1920s and 30s your life expectancy was in the 60s or so maybe even less and we've certainly extended that because we've been able to reduce cardiovascular deaths which is the number one killer of men and women in the in western civilization um, why is it important, uh, in, and I've been researching this, why is it important to vessel prep a patient? Well, so the term vessel prep um, speaks to the notion of before you do a definitive treatment. So let's say we found a blockage in your thigh artery. It was narrow, let's say, 100%. So it was blocked 100%, and we open it up. Well... The definitive treatment, meaning what's kind of the last thing that you're going to do to try to keep this vessel open, oftentimes depends on how well you will prepare the vessel, meaning attempt to remove plaque or push the plaque aside, or if there's a lot of calcification, disrupt the calcification so you can put your stent in and have it expand to fit the wall of the artery appropriately, or same with the balloon. And so the term vessel preparation, it means a lot, but it's, it's kind of that work that you do before you're getting ready to do the last bit of the procedure. So a lot of, I'm a, I like baseball, and so I kind of 
speak to my patients during the case about, you know, we're on first base, we're on second base, et cetera. And so, you know, vessel prep gets you probably to second base and maybe considering stealing third, um, but you're close. You're close once you once you prep the vessel because then you're just planning the last parts of the procedure. Okay, this, this is kind of a long one. Um, okay. I'm ready for you, Lawrence. <laughs> okay, because I had gotten a little help with it. Um, I read a couple. I read a couple of ProPublica uh, articles online, and those um, other device. Like, um, there's devices and how they're bad. How they were bad, and uh, so many doctors are using them and should not be using them. Um, how? How as a patient, how is a patient supposed to know whether or not to use, you know, to, to get it or not? We learn from these articles uh, that are written about medical procedures on how, how or how not to trust your doctor when making the right decisions uh, for you in these, in, in these type of articles. We as special needs don't always get the respect from our doc from doctors when we speak up or something like this. How <clears throat> how do we know uh, that a doctor is not just using the device to make money? And how do we know that the doctor isn't just amputating because of the money uh, and because we? We don't know how to use that device like that. Did I say that correctly? Yeah, I mean, I think what you're getting at is the... Is so it, Is it the right care, basically? Right, and number one, I've always believed that just like there are good chefs and good mechanics and good teachers, there are good physicians and there are also bad physicians. And I don't think... There are physicians out there are, that are maliciously trying to hurt patients, or at least I hope not. But the problem that we run into is what's called the fee-for-service model in medicine. Now, in full disclosure, I work for Ohio Health, which is a large health system in central Ohio. Um, I like working for them, but I am a salaried physician, meaning it doesn't matter how many procedures I do my paycheck is just the same, okay? Now, in a fee-for-service model, the more procedures you do, the more money you make. And there are some procedures that make more money. Now, that playbook, so to speak, was written by the government and, and CMS who, you know, kind of dictates what reimbursements are, what doctors get paid for, and what the hospitals get paid for certain procedures. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not suggesting that physicians who work in a fee-for-model service and do a lot of um, procedures that get reimbursed very well are doing something unethical or illegal. They're just kind of playing in, in the sandbox of this model. And so there are certain procedures that are very lucrative and the devices that are used in those procedures are, are sometimes very easy to use. And so you have to be, you have to be careful. Okay. Um, and I think 99 out of a hundred physicians want to do the right thing for their patient, but there are bad actors and, and those bad apples kind of spoil the whole bunch. So I, I always recommend to patients, number one, if you have peripheral arterial disease, that you seek multiple opinions, you have a, I call them consultants, but a family member or a caregiver or someone you trust come with you or t several people come with you to the visit and ask specific questions of your physician, mainly, do you typically treat people like me? Um, uh, you know, I, I think it'd be very reasonable to ask about case volumes, how much of this do you do, and and so forth. You have to, it's shared decision making. I, my relationship with the patient is, I, with my patients is kind of like, I'm the coach, you're the quarterback. Um, I'm here to help guide you. 
I'm going to give you some plays to work with, but you ultimately kind of have to execute the play. And it doesn't hurt my feelings if someone wants to talk to another physician in a specialty similar to mine about their care. Um, I think that's healthy. I don't think any patient, unless in some relative extreme, should accept the notion that the first procedure that they have with peripheral arterial disease is a major amputation. Mm -hmm. So always question that a little bit, but I also, you have to be careful about potentially physicians who are maybe known for doing a lot of procedures that uh, are, are, are very lucrative. So I think there's a good balance that you need to find. Okay. I hope I answered your question okay. That's good. Um, uh, how would you describe the overall current state of peripheral artery disease in the United States? I would say that we have made a lot of, stride, uh, of strides to preventing amputation. Unfortunately, somebody who has the worst part of peripheral arterial disease, which I haven't spoken the term yet, but it's called critical limb ischemia or chronic limb threatening ischemia. We often call it CLI. Those patients have a very high mortality and morbidity rate, meaning they die early and they have a lot of medical issues. In fact, depending on what you read, 40% of, of those patients who are diagnosed with this are, uh, are dead within four years. Um, and so, four years? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it's almost half of them in four years. And so you have to not only, again, it's about being react or proactive, I should say, instead of reactive and trying to help reduce the risks that, the, that ultimately lead to peripheral arterial disease. So we've done a very poor job of being proactive in these, in these patients. And I think we've also, we need to get better at underserved populations. We need to get better at um, getting into more urban areas. And, um, you know, part of what Kim McNicholas does and what I do with the Heart of Innovation and the Save My Piggies is to attempt to raise awareness for patients and to patients that have or are at risk for peripheral arterial disease because you empower them and they're armed with the right questions and the right support staff and the right decision-making abilities to work with their physician to help get them treated properly, safely, and prevent that amputation and, and hopefully have them live a better life. Mm. Well, when you say proactive and reactive in this case, explain what you mean. Well, so, so for example, something that's reactive is you coming to see me with, say, pain in your legs when you walk and we find that you have a blockage and it's bothering you such that we need, we consider a, a procedure and we have the procedure. I'm kind of reacting to the fact that you've had this blockage. But if we rewind the clock and say you're 45 now, if you, we could rewind the clock when you're 25, what can we do to proactively prevent this from happening? Meaning keep a closer eye on your risk factors. If you're smoking, get you to stop smoking early, get you to exercise more, eat better, reduce your risk for diabetes, and then you know monitor your cholesterol and, and be a little bit more aggressive with cholesterol management. Mm. Um, are you concerned about the specific, uh, since we said that, one of the main questions, um, and we do have some time left, because um, I want to get into Save My Piggies. Um, are you concerned about any specific population of patients, such as African Americans, more than others? Um, do they get concerned? about special needs if they're not uh, too mobile? I mean, so I am concerned about any patient population that is underserved. And so it happens to be African-Americans. It also happens to be in more uh, rural areas, too, where potentially the socioeconomics, uh, that playing field is not as 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 level as those of other places. The insight with respect to their disease process is not as um, 
in they're not as in tune to it unfortunately with and and we've done a lot of work with african americans there there is some general mistrust with the medical field um in that particular ethnicity and, and we need to do a better job of of you know answering questions rectifying that but anybody people that have peripheral arterial disease typically and i'm this is my opinion but at least in my patient pro, uh, practice they have lower socioeconomic needs than those that develop coronary artery disease. And, um, you know, because of that, there's all sorts of uh, baggage that, that goes along, and we just have to get better at educating patients. Mm -hmm. um, what are some foods that you can suggest to your patients to have a better diet when it comes to peripheral artery disease? So in general, as a cardiologist, we kind of speak about the Mediterranean diet. So it's a focus on vegetables and fruits. It's a focus on olive oil, for example, for your, your, your fats as opposed to butter. It's a focus on fish, white meats, uh, legumes for your protein as opposed to red meats. Really, I'm, I am a big proponent of intermittent fasting i believe that eating you know so in the western civilization we have access to food all the time we have access to cheap food all the time and that cheap food isn't necessarily the healthiest thing for us and so i am a proponent of intermittent fasting and that's in my mind it's kind of like the, the caveman approach where back in the day when you had to go physically hunt for your food you probably didn't have any food in the morning and you went out and hunted and then you ate what you killed and then you went to bed and so i personally fast uh, typically from 8 p.m to noon and then from noon to eight uh, i eat and i try to eat healthy but again i'm as i'm just like everybody else i like a hamburger every once in a while and some pizza and everything. Life is about moderation. Um, and life is also short too. And so it's important to enjoy what you enjoy, but do it in moderation. And I kind of do the 85, 15 or 90, 10 rule. 90% of the time I'm eating what I should. And maybe that 10% I'm cheating a little bit, but in general, I, if it, I would look up the Mediterranean diet and I would also, I also tell patients to, use smaller plates because when you when you fill up a small plate it looks like there's a lot of food there and you get a big plate you can put a lot of food on that so use smaller plates and consider the mediterranean diet mm -hmm. um do you wish you could do more for your patients mm. yeah i mean i think we all wish we could do more for our patients there are some times where you, you just like, for example, yesterday I had a patient that he's elderly, he's, he smoked his whole life. Unfortunately, he's got really bad lung disease. He doesn't move around much, and, and he's got horrific blockages that I felt that me trying to open them up would put him at more risk than benefit. And so there are times when you just, there's nothing you can do or nothing I think you should do. Uh, it's... You know, there's the old adage, you, you go to a barber, you're going to get a haircut. And so you, that's something you see an interventionalist, you might get a procedure, but oftentimes just because we can doesn't mean we should. But there are some cases where it's just too late and um, there doesn't matter what I do from a plumbing standpoint, that patient is still destined for an amputation, which is why... I've really of late started to harp on exercise and tobacco cessation and making sure your blood sugars are under control, you know, reducing your diabetic risk. So there's a, there's a lot of things that patients can do for themselves. And like, a, that's why it's a coach quarterback relationship. I mean, we're kind of in this together. And once you get buy-in from your patient, then there's a lot of positive things that can happen. But if you don't have buy-in from your patient, um, unfortunately, a lot of negative things occur, and it's a downstream snowball-like effect. Um, we might go over a couple more seconds, but um, do, you, do you have any regrets on choosing 
the uh, interventional um, uh, interventional cardiology. Is there anything else you could have done instead? Um, well, Lawrence, I learned early on in my life that I was not going to be making any money playing sports. Um, I got cut from my freshman basketball team, and I was lucky that's, enough to that play. That song put me in coach, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was I was lucky enough to be on a football team that won the state championship, and I had a very nominal role. Uh, but I, I realized that I wasn't going to be making money doing that. And so um, I studied chemistry in college. My father was a chemist and had a plastics business. I don't know if you've ever uh, seen a cheese. I'm from Wisconsin originally. And the cheese heads yeah. uh, that uh, he, he made those or at least the formula for them. And so um, that was my fallback. If I didn't get into medical school, thankfully I got in. And I'm very happy with what I, I do because there is this r real sense of gratitude in the patients when you help them during a, a, a heart attack or um, we treat patients that have blood clots in their lungs you get them feeling better and folks with peripheral arterial disease you save save the piggies save the legs a lot of a, a lot of gratitude and, and i'm thankful and i'm always learning and there are good days and bad but we help more people than we hurt but if you're asking me if i wish i could have done something else outside of medicine i've always wanted to try my um my way at stand-up comedy and so <laughs> i might i might consider that um you know no uh, well since since we said that um in terms of your medical and your training um is there any other training that you've wished that school would have been that would have provided you better to better prepare for what you face today as a doctor yeah, I mean, honestly, I wish we would have had a little bit better um, administrative uh, mm. guidance. So a lot of what we do, especially is, I'm sorry for interrupting, especially during COVID. COVID must have been a complete mess for doctors. It it, it was. I mean, we you went from kind of running red line and going 100 miles an hour to all of a sudden zero, and it was very a very interesting time and i will say that COVID has the reverberations of cooperation and the oscillations of it still persist to, of COVID still persist today where it, it's kind of difficult some in my opinion to get engagement in people um i think people have in the healthcare field have realized they can uh, you know generate a wage outside the hospital so it's very difficult to keep staff sometimes and People are a little bit less motivated, in my opinion. Um, but in medical school, I wish we probably would have had a better uh, just kind of understanding of the business behind medicine and, and how that affects patient care. I would also, I also complain because I spend too much time in front of a computer during charting and less time sometimes discussing things with patients, which is why I do enjoy the, the Save My Piggies and the Heart of Innovation podcast because we get to talk to patients and, and hear their side of the story mm. um and then and then we'll get in you know we'll get into safe my piggies but uh what are some last pieces of advice for people with special needs uh to make sure they get the best care well i would just like to say that i again having a brother with down syndrome he has brought a lot of joy in, into our lives and I love the fact that, so, you know, as a, as a, as a person, we all are um, faced with certain stimuli. And when that stimuli is presented to us, there's a period of time where we can create a response. And you control that time and you control that response. And, and some people, whether they have special needs or not, give up fit one face with a certain stimulus and others don't and i always encourage people to never give up if you believe in something work for it and and you'll probably be successful um with respect to just understand with folks with special needs if you're ha if, if you know that you have trouble understanding or comprehending make sure you tell your physician to slow down Make sure you ask questions. Sometimes record the conversation, I think, helps too. And also have 
as I say, a good consultant or two with you so they can hear and ask questions on your behalf. Okay. Um, before we go, um, tell us about the Save My Piggies and your, and your radio show. Go ahead. Sure. So the radio show is called The Heart of Innovation. We go live every Saturday, 11, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 Pacific. And uh, I, the, I have to be 100% transparent. 90% of the work, if not more, is done by my co-host, uh, Kim McNicholas, who um, has a nonprofit called The Way to My Heart. And, and uh, The Heart of Innovation is about medical innovation. It's uh, having conversations about those that are trying to move the needle with respect to health care. Um, based out of San Francisco. I'm in Columbus. So, you know, naturally she sees and has access to more kind of techie things than I do. So we're able to interview folks in Silicon Valley and see what's going on. We've we've talked about, you know, AI. We've talked about, um, you know, apps for food and, and we've had um the uh, some leadership from the Steve Gleason Foundation for ALS on and and then the Save My Piggies is basically it started out as me kind of getting fed up with patients accepting or having to deal with the terms of hey you need a major amputation without getting adequate care and without them the patient knowing enough to ask like hey are there other options and so it's it's a forum for the patient to tell their their story they're not all vascular um, and, you know, hopefully we'll branch out. I think Kim told me this week we have almost 50 episodes. And so it's, it's patients that have patients and families. They tell their, their story and oftentimes their physician is on. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll have a, a, a conference that uh, is um, kind of a WebEx, so to speak, or a Zoom, so to speak, across the country. Just having physicians and patients together and sharing stories and we can all learn from each other and it's empowering patients and one last thing is i've learned so much about empathy and you know seeing the patient's point of view with respect to the procedures that we do and and their perspective and it's really been quite eye-opening for me so i'm grateful that we're able to do it and and hopefully and Lawrence, when did, you've, when you've did your in. radio show um go on air or because i know it's live so yeah it's, so it's live saturday i'm sorry saturdays uh every saturday um 8 8 or excuse me 11 pacific 2 p.m eastern okay. and then we're um we have a youtube channel now and then we also are on um, itunes and spotify and all that stuff as the heart of innovation okay and save my piggies and then uh, I also want to mention that uh, The Way to My Heart is at www.thewaytomyheart.org is, um, is um, also uh, the CEO of that is um, Kim McNicholas. And it's now, The Way to My Heart is also now called the Global Pad Association, Saving Life and Limb Together. So for more information on peripheral artery disease and that website, you can go to www thewaytomyheart.org, which is now the Global Pad Association. And then um, also there is a, um, let me get to the hotline. Do you, do you know the hotline number off, offhand? I do not know the, the, the leg saver hotline. I do know while you're looking it up, I can provide a little color. I know it allows patients to have access to an individual or several individuals that can help them um, potentially get to a, another care facility or answer some questions. It's all about kind of saving yeah, life and um, uh, It's not giving me the number here, but for more information on the Global Pad Association and Way to My Heart, you can go to www.waytomyheart.com Dot org and don't forget to listen to Dr. Phillips and uh, Kim McNicholas, who is an Emmy Award winning uh, Emmy Award Emmy Award winning uh, journalist and host uh, for the Save My Pickies uh, 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 radio program on Saturdays uh, uh, Pacific and Eastern. Correct? Yeah, eleven Pacific and two. PM Eastern. Okay. And thank you so much, Dr. Phillips, for joining uh, us today on Abled and On Air. And for more information on Abled and On Air, you can go to www.orcamedia.net. Um, thank you, Dr. Phillips. 
See you next time. Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps, Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yihad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Abel Denonair has been seen in the following publications. Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Ableton On Air is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, Boston, New England chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists.